So hi everyone, uh, my name is Alexis. Today I'm gonna to be talking about circular economy and waste management systems in New York City. Uh, circular economy and waste management systems are very important and directly linked to architecture and construction fields. I have a background in architecture for my undergraduate, so it's something I hold near and dear to my heart. Uh, when it comes to meeting sustainability and emission goals in New York City, it's important to consider how we can better commercial solid waste management and mitigation practices. Our goal is to reach out to those who may be underprivileged, undereducated, or misinformed regarding sustainable practices and waste management systems. Through my research, I'll work to uncover New York City's potential for new waste management practices and the impact of circular economy. So first, we're going to talk about circular economy and architecture. A circular economy is an economic system which focuses on reducing and eventually eliminating waste. The three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, are the founding principles of a circular economy. A linear economy is a more traditional system which uses a step-by-step -step plan, take, make, dispose, to manufacture as well as waste management practices. Within this process, raw materials are collected, transformed, and then uh, transformed into products for specific uses, and then finally discarded at waste uh, for the end of life. Value is created in this system by producing and selling as many products are possible. On the other hand, uh, circular economy advocates for reducing the use of raw materials, reusing materials to make new products, and recycling existing products. This process is considered restorative and regenerative, using more efficient renewable energy sources, reducing pollutants and toxic chemicals while working to completely eliminate waste. Business models that seek to utilize a circular economy use materials more efficiently and maintain maximum product value at all times. Countries are now working towards uh, utilizing more sustainable and efficient circular models uh, as opposed to the current linear models. And I strongly believe that New York City should do so as well. With the continued use of linear economy, a global material crisis is imminent. Recycling will no longer be a choice, but a necessity as the amount of raw materials continues to decline. There may be a paradigm shift in domestic behavior, manufacturing, construction, and design. And honestly, with COVID-19, the pandemic, we've kind of seen this start to happen. Rethinking initiative, uh, initial manufacturing design techniques with the architecture of waste, uh, which is a resource that I used uh, for my research, uh, provides a hopeful outlook for the future. In the last 30 years, our global material extraction has more than doubled and it's estimated to continue. From 71.6 billion metric tons of raw materials entering the system in 2010 and about 90.4 billion tons in 2020. The cost of real resource prices, which is fossil fuels in particular, has supported the continued economic growth since the 1850s. It was cheaper and easier to obtain and afterwards to dispose of primary materials than reusing or recycling. The most economically efficient gains are from the substitution of labor for additional resources, which is, uh, is not the most sustainable choice, to be honest. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was an economic shift, uh, which you guys can see kind of on these graphs on the page as I'm talking through this, um, which essentially replicates the resource prices um, seen in both figures 5.2 and 5.3. As noted in the 2016 World Economic Forum, quote, the turn of the millennia marked the point where real prices of natural resources began to climb upwards, essentially erasing a country's worth of real price declines, end quote. At the same time, the turn of the century was being classified as the higher price volatility than any single decade of the 20th century. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation, another resource which I had used and looked into, uh, is a leader of conceptual and political development of a circular economy, and they believe that moving from a linear to circular economy will provide material savings high, valued higher than one trillion dollars. Both ecological and economic considerations are taken into account for this calculation. There are also several issues outside of the global waste crisis that are in, uh, inescapable, such as cultural physiques, political, economic, manufacturing, marketing, and material sciences. The architecture of waste is an important resource for us to reimagine the role of an architect in the addressing the urgent material crisis with the design process. Now I'm going to specifically speak on waste management in New York City. So there's two different uh, graphics as I kind of go through these notes here. Um, the one on the left is more of like a breakdown of waste uh, in New York City. And the one on the right is kind of showing you visually like how um, waste management export facilities and waste sheds um, are kind of divvied through the um, Manhattan and uh, borough areas. 
So, and they are export facilities and that's really big into what my project kind of speaks more about. So one third of New York City's residential garbage is recyclables. One third of it is organic waste. A quarter of it is labeled as other and about 10% of it, um, which is also the fastest growing waste composition is electronics. Uh, commercial waste management is equally as significant as residential waste management. Commercial waste management accounts for roughly 75% of New York City's total waste stream. However, unlike residential rate waste, commercial waste is managed by the private sector uh, and not the city of New York. So that's really big as well because that kind of talks more um, about like how they pay for it and the money that goes into it and the costs. Um, so I'll speak on that a little bit later. Um, and again, that's managed by the Department of Sanitation. Uh, in the past, the city has allowed these private haulers to take advantage of the existing solid waste infrastructure, such as landfills. The sector is also composed of a large network of land-based transfer stations, which is, again, the image on the right, um, points for waste collection, truck transfers for long-distance exports. Typically, these stations are loc located within the city's M3 districts. Within the manufacturing three districts are heavy industry facilities that generate noise, traffic, and pollutants. So obviously, really not good for living. Uh, this can be included, but not limited to solid waste transfer facilities, power plants, recycling plants, and fuel supply depots. A major concern for New York City is the lack of private transfer stations, meaning that most of the waste produced within Manhattan is driven out of the city into other boroughs before being exported. This creates further traffic congestion for large trucks hauling materials. So again, there's two different graphics here, uh, which I'm going to speak on. Um, the one uh, to the left is GHG emissions, as well as the middle one. Uh, and the two on the right are kind of breaking down um, like the annual GHGs, where they come from within the city, as well as what source they're from. So GHGs are greenhouse gas emissions, and they're calculated and reported by the Global Protocol for Cities, the GCP. Uh, the energy considered in this inventory consists of energy by buildings, stationary sources, road transportation, railways, marine navigation, and aviation within the city limits itself, as well as wastewater treatments and solid waste generated within the city. In 2016, the city's GHG emissions were 52 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Um, so that's about on average in 2016, 6.1 metric tons of carbon dioxide per capita. Um, which is lower than the American average, but still high for a single city. Uh, since 2015, the emissions themselves have, have remained somewhat flat. Consumption emissions stem from energy use, transportation, waste management, and supply chains, goods, and services. And the economy in New York City drives many of its GHG emissions beyond the city limits and can be re represented as literally consumption emissions equals production emissions plus imported emissions minus exported emissions. Um, the city accounting for consumption-based emissions is defined by the emissions within the city boundaries minus those, like I had just said, um, to meet the outside demand of the city itself. In New York City, there are three sectors that produce the most GHG emissions, which is stationary en energy, such as buildings, transportation, and waste. Uh, waste itself uh, accounts for 4%, while the combustion of natural gases accounts for 21% within the city. Uh, and that's mostly from like the combustion of like gasoline, obviously, um, from these trucks that are like shipping out that waste. Lots of numbers. <laughs> there, it only gets uh, to be more numbers. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the impact of landfills. Uh, what happens to the towns and people around the landfills, which our garbage ends up, right? We throw it out, it ends up on the corner and somebody takes it away and we never see it again. Well, hopefully, right? Um, so there is this individual that I researched, uh, his name's uh, Glenn Silver. He lives about three miles from the Seneca Meadows Landfill in Waterloo, New York. Um, a lot of our distribution as seen to the uh, image to the right actually goes to a lot of different states outside of New York, which is kind of gross and disgusting. Um, this individual says, depending on the day that the smell coming from the landfill itself can churn his stomach. Um, a group in his uh, town, also known as the concerned citizens of their county, uh, have battled against the landfill for nearly six years as they believe its unhealthy effects on their community. The landfill has continued to grow, receiving about 5,500 tons of trash daily, while the highest peak itself is about 275 feet tall. Imagine that, that's crazy. Uh, Mayor de Blasio uh, has this plan called One New York City, uh, and in that plan, his goal is for zero waste to landfills by 2030. He's pledged to wind down shipments to landfills by increasing the use of plants that incinerate trash to generate energy. 
This may, however, raise further concerns on emissions. You know, there's already a plant that does this in Chester, Pennsylvania, uh, run by Corvanta Energy, which is the world's largest energy from waste plants. Um, and since they've already implemented this practice, we do have some insight. Um, they've accepted about 500,000 tons of New York City garbage in the last year, which generates power for their facilities across the area. Mike Ewall, an environmental justice advocate, believes that this term waste to energy is actually misleading because the plants themselves lack in capturing the pollutants that they produce from burning the trash. So therefore it's releasing these toxins into the air without the proper technology and safety precautions. It's really just harmful to us. And now favorite part of econ, more numbers. Um, so this is kind of where I got all of my numbers for my final piece, which is gonna be the cost benefit analysis. So I really called this the cost to implement waste management systems. Um, the Business Integrity Commission, also known as the BIC, is a regulatory and law enforcement agency that oversees the sanitation industry uh, and public wholesale markets in New York City. They work to uh, eliminate a bunch of crime and corruption and criminality, which is not limited to the marketplaces, remaining free from violence, fraud, rackets, threats, customer receiving fair treatment, all of that good stuff. Um, they also help to licensure, license and register businesses within the private sanitation industry or public wholesale markets. Um, so essentially, they make recommendations to the Department of Sanitation concerning the fitness of applicants to operate transfer stations, which the transfer stations play an integral role in transporting solid waste out of Manhattan, which I had already mentioned. Um, and within the field of architecture and construction, there are many carting companies which are registered in the BIC to collect solely waste materials from building and demolition, construction, alterations, all of those things. Um, and there's really a cost um, to this. So the rate applies to any regular waste or any waste that could be um, like composted, grease trap waste, anything like that. And there's a maximum rate permitted, which is either 18.27 per cubic yard, uh, that's US dollars, or uh, loose refuse by volume, or there's a by weight uh, price, which is $11.98 per 100 pounds of refuse. Again, that's through the BIC. Um, the waste export budget in 2020 for New York City was $432 million. That is up from 2019, where it was $410 million. That budget only covers refuse handled in landfills and incinerators, uh, since recycling and other organics are processed separately. Organics budget was $32 million in 2019, which is increased by another $19 million in 2020. New York City Solid Waste Management Plan, also called SWMP, is calling for an increased use for long-term contracts through the rail and trucking companies. This will hope to, uh, help to impact the environment, um, hopefully a little less, and guarantee future availability for land, uh, landfills while also implementing long-term contracts in, term, in lieu of the short-term contracts. Um, so these would be about 20 years plus uh, with a renewal option up to 10 years and they would actually cost uh, less. The short-term land contracts peaked in 2019 at a massive $129 billion per ton. Um, and it has been determined by the Department of Sanitation that in order to continue exporting waste, the cost to export must be reduced. It is estimated that by implementing a residential curbside organics division, citywide will also help uh, these savings. Just a few more numbers here and then I'll be done. Um, the cost of New York City garbage collection and disposal in 2012. Um, so as you can see uh, to the bottom left, the DSNY, so the Department of Sanitation, was $1,122, while disposal was $452. Uh, private collection was 526, while disposal was 205. So again, um, going through the Department of Sanitation, which is the public sector, is a little bit more expensive than going through the private sectors. Um, New York City spends about $1.5 billion annually for residential and public trash pickup. This includes 2,000 garbage trucks, 5,900 sanitation wor world, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, areas, and a cost of about $500 per household. So essentially, all of this is saying it is very expensive to throw your garbage out in New York City. Um, transportation of waste produces over 1 million tons of GHG emissions annually, which I did go into the cost of that as well. Um, and there is also other fees that can be implemented or that are being looked into, such as a garbage fee. This can be seen in different cities, such as Seattle, San Jose, San Antonio, and Dallas. 
Dallas in particular has this fee because they want people to be more conscious of what they're throwing out and how they're throwing their, their materials out. Um, their fee has increased by 3% from the initial $20.64 to $21.34 in 2015. This covers merit pay and fleet maintenance. This is essentially like the New York City water bill um, and is honestly kind of a good idea. Uh, it's good to get people to know why they're paying for things. And it also helps um, with, like I said, making sure that everything works. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts to, to actually throwing garbage out. Um, so yeah, again, the cost of solid waste management in New York City is likely to increase in the coming years. Uh, the 2011 contract with sanitation workers is set to expire and currently under consideration. And roughly 60% of the DSNY budget, which is about $927 million, is allocated to workers' wages, insurance policies, and pensions. Um, Mayor de Blasio's environmental agenda, landfill reduction, is a key component. The goal is to increase residential waste diver diversion from 15 to 30% by 2020, which obviously has passed, um, while continuing to expand residential and commercial organic waste collections. They have also committed to reducing GHG emissions by 80% or 3.8 million tons by 2050 and announced during the 2013 Plan New York City report. So finally, after you have received all of those great numbers, I put this into a spreadsheet. <laughs> Uh, and essentially the key takeaways here is um, the operation costs, the land use charges, um, the avoided land use uh, from the landfills and the avoided CO2 emissions. That's kind of what I focused on here. Um, it was very difficult because there is so, so many numbers and moving parts and different things to focus on to really understand and know what to put into this. So I, that's what I focused on. That's what I thought was important for like my um, TED talk here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I know it's hard to read. So I did actually send the professor um, the PDF copy <laughs> or the Excel copy. So uh, I do apologize about that. But yeah, hopefully your brain is now mushy like mine was while writing this. <laughs> and I hope that you learned something about the New York City waste management. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis, and, and great job, and congratulations on sifting through all those those numbers and, and making sense of that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, um, you know, uh, part of the work is, you know, uh, you know, figuring out what, what can we actually take and glean from some of the numbers we have, and uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there's, that. like, so much. I was, like, I, you'll, I wish I could show you the draft of the essay. I was, like, yeah. how do I put all these together? <laughs> yeah. That's the challenge, but yeah, I mean, you. Do, I think you did a great job. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, what would you, I mean, based on your your cost benefit analysis, uh, you know, what would your recommendations be? It's interesting that um, you had that one chart up that showed, uh, I think, it was from organics, and like it seems like for uh, most of the the composting or anaerobic anaerobic digestion uh, technologies, it's like it's actually uh, benefit cost positive until you get to curbside collection. And, you know, curious, um, you know, what some of your, your takeaways are around that. Yeah. I mean, like, I thought the whole organics thing was pretty interesting because I think it like is being treated separately than like all of the other like streamlined waste, which I think is necessary. Um, and in the actual essay, I, I did talk a little bit more about like the organics portion of it. Um, and I actually put that in the cost benefit because there was, a um, recent addition um, to the organics program. So they put $32 million up front um, for this program. And essentially what that is, is to expand the policies, I guess. And then they added another $19 million to expand the only facility that's currently, I believe in Staten Island. Um, and I actually use that to like, I know it's far-fetched, but when I was doing the cost benefit, I used it to, estimate the implement implementation of a circular economy like intervention. So essentially like the upfront cost of the facility materials and any other things like for the policy making aspect of it. Um, I think that's like completely necessary. What really was compelling to me, like I think aside from the money aspect of it was how many CO2 emissions there are because um, the way that I did it in the cross benefit was the avoided CO2 emissions was Five fifty-seven thousand three hundred and twenty U.S. tons per year. I believe that's correct. Yeah, no, fifty-seven point three two. Sorry, that's not a comma. Uh, U.S. tons per year, and that equated to if you do the six hundred dollars assumption for the cost of carbon, it equates to like 
a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> like 34,000 ton uh, dollars per ton of carbon avoided, which is like wild. Cause so like you not only have like the literal, like, okay, we're moving this waste and, and removing that. Now we like have a cost to like the environment almost like you're putting like a dollar sign on like benefiting the, the environment. Um, and really our pockets, because if New York City decides to put on a garbage tax, tax, whether it's or fee, whether it's for regular streamlined waste or for organics, like that still comes out of like your money, like if right. you live in the city. So I, it was a very interesting project. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was difficult. I'll be 100% honest. It was very yeah. difficult. But I'm very happy that I pushed through it. And I hope that you guys enjoyed it because like, I don't know, garbage is something that we all have and we all have like a common, you know, point on that. So I hope that we can like all learn a little bit and be a little bit more conscious of like, you know, how we're throwing things out and stuff. Yeah, for sure. And I I believe um, uh, Sarah's uh, presentation later, I I know that she was also looking particularly into, you know, some of those um, issues around, you know, uh, curbside collection or bringing to, you know, a central facility and and what that looks like. And, you know, I think that's an important part of the equation as well. So I'm interested to see a little bit more about curbside, like people to facility, because I was focusing on facility to landfill. I was thinking like more of like the bigger things. So I'm interested to see like how our costs now, like our individual costs, like kind of pertain on our everyday. So definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that'll be a good lead in. Um,